Hey guys, welcome back. We are on Discerning the Voice of God, week uh, three, day four. So let's pray and get started. I pray you guys had a blessed week and that you're ready to get started. Uh, let's pray. Precious Daddy, we just thank you so much for this wonderful day, Lord. We thank you for whatever weather you have for us, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you are our provider, Father. Thank you for our homes and everything that is in it and around it and all who are in it, Father. Thank you for your Holy Spirit and your presence being inside of our hearts and our homes, Father. Help us to be lights in this dark world, Father. Help us to um, discern truth, Father, and and to just follow you in all things, Lord, no matter the cost, Father, because you paid the ultimate cost on the cross, Father, and I just thank you, Lord, that we are able to do the same because we love you, Father, and I just pray, Lord, that you will bless each and every one of us in this in your word and in this Bible study, Father, and that you will continue to grow us and change us and use us in this dark place. We love you, Daddy, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so week three, day four, peace, harmony. So we're on page 92. Peace is an important facet to accurately hearing God because he desires unity and mutual edification within the body of Christ. Scripture urges us to be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4.3 We're to pursue peace with others. So in your own words, what makes peace such a high value commodity among the body of Christ? And Ephesians 2, 13, 22, I'm going to read it to you. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. And he's referring to the Jews and the Gentiles there. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and those are us, are the Gentiles, and to them that were not, and that was the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for, for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So again, the question is, what makes peace such a high-value commodity among the body of Christ? And I put, it brings all people together, both Jews and Gentiles, it brings God and I together because he broke down that wall that was between us that we couldn't reach. It brings peace to those far away from God and those near to him. And there's no need for fighting, separation, etc. We are all one body. Um, so she says, earlier we looked at Paul's illustration in Romans 14 concerning the eating of different types of food. Believers with Gentile backgrounds freely ate all things, while many of those with a Jewish background observed the ceremonial laws concerning food and felt convicted about eating foods that had been offered to idols. Paul's advice? Remain true to your own conviction in disputable matters such as these. But he also offered a warning. So, Romans 14, 19 through 20 says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. So, she asks, what's the main principle Paul was addressing in this verse? 
And I put to not do things, even if we know it's not a sin, to offend others, especially new believers. She says the work of God is so much more important than some trivial issue like what kind of food to eat. We're supposed to be pursuing peace and building one another up. Before exercising what we feel to be our freedoms, we need to be aware of how we're affecting others. When the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to see a fellow believer who could be hurt by what you're about to do, this is generally his way of saying, not now. It doesn't mean you've lost that freedom forever, but you're not to enjoy it in that moment. Pursuing peace and keeping a brother from stumbling outweighs personal freedoms. So James three fourteen through 18... But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So she says, James describes how we can discern wisdom from God. In verse 17 in the margin, underline all the descriptive words that are indicative of divine wisdom. And then circle any that emphasize the principle of today's lesson. So I underlined pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, and without hypocrisy. And I circled peaceable and without hypocrisy. I'll put this back Alright. So page 94. Now look at verse 14 in the margin and put an asterisk beside descriptive words that indicate demonic influence in our lives. And verse 14 says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. So I put asterisks next to jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogant, and lie against the truth. So on page 95, she says, as believers, our goal should be to clear the path in front of those who are prone to stumble to protect them from a weakened conscience or a weakened commitment to the Lord. If we aren't careful, however, the enemy can take advantage of us, even in our trying to be considerate. He can transfer the pressure we feel to keep our fellow believers safe into an area of bondage for us where we lose the ability to enjoy any freedoms because we're constantly worried about how they'll affect others. Should other people's opinions be our principal guide in what we decide to do? Are there any, are they our substitute conscience? How worried should we be about what other people think? What if trying to be cautious with one group or person's feelings puts, puts us at risk of disrupting our peace with someone else? Didn't Paul say in another context, am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Galatians 1.10 I found the following to be a good advice in managing this balancing act of freedom and forbearance. In order for someone to stumble, the person must be moving, right? Generally moving forward. If you're sensing a check, a pause, or worrying that an action of yours might cause another to stumble, ask yourself if the person or people in mind are growing, maturing, and proactively seeking God. Those are the ones you need to be most concerned about. Other people, those who aren't even trying to grow, who aren't responding to what's obviously in front of their faces anyway, likely shouldn't factor into your decision. How can they stumble if they're not even moving? That was a good, that was a good uh, example of that. I really appreciated that um, because I do, because of my codependency, I do worry about uh, my actions and stuff with others. But, you know, you can't, 
with people who aren't growing, especially, you know, dealing with unbelievers and stuff. Yeah, you have to show the love of Christ, but you also have to be truthful, too. And so, um, in regards to our beliefs and stuff. And so, uh, that was, that was really good for me. I really enjoyed that. Um, she says, being aware of how our actions will affect other believers is one way the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Why do you think the enemy might not want believers to recognize this element of God's personal communication with his people? She says, choose three of the following verses. And so I'm going to read them all to you first, and then I'll tell you what I chose. Um, so Psalm 34, 14 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it, which is peace. Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Mark 16, 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Romans 12.10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. 1 Corinthians 10.33, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Colossians 3.15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. So for me, she says, read each from your Bible, then record below how they speak to you regarding a current relationship in your life. So I chose Psalm 34, 14, and I said, this is how I need to be in my home to shine for Christ. And I chose Colossians 3, 15, and this is how I need to be at all times in all situations. And I chose Mark 16, 15, and what I'm trying to do on social media and on my YouTube channel. God loves unity and always encourages us to pursue peace. When determining whether or not you're hearing God's voice, ask yourself, will the message I'm hearing impede another's spiritual growth? Will it cause unnecessary conflict between myself and an un another believer? If the answer to either of these questions is yes, pause and ask the Lord for clarity before moving forward. Better to delay your plans and seek the Lord's will from a pure heart, not wanting to do anything to shake another's faith or create unneeded distraction and turmoil that may require a lot of wasted time and explanation on the back end. Pure, peaceable relationships are important to God. He will not lead us to hinder peace and unity in the body of Christ. This doesn't mean that everyone will agree with what you're doing. But it does mean your decision will not cause another believer to stumble. So that is it for today. Um, I pray you guys have a blessed week. Again, don't forget to subscribe so you know when my uh, videos come out. Because sometimes I get off schedule. I try to do every day or every Tuesday at midnight. Um, but sometimes I get off schedule. You know, kids, life, craziness. Um, like and subscribe, um, share, um, tell others about this Bible study. Um, don't forget to jump on the Discord. It's a free app. Um, there's another video, um, that'll give you the link and stuff and how to use it and everything. And I'm looking forward to seeing y'all on there and getting to know everybody and having this more, um, sociable, more interactive than just me talking to you. Um, so please jump on board that. I'm excited for that. Um, and I pray that y'all have a blessed week. Um, don't forget to check out my book on YouTube, on YouTube, on Amazon. Um, it's called Embracing Brokenness by Linda Bolton. Um, check that out. Um, it's free if you have the Kindle Unlimited. Um, it is available in paperback. Um, and so uh, go check that out too because it's, it's God wrote that. I, he just used these little fingers to tap. And it's really, really, really good. Um, and uh, I pray you guys are blessed with that also. And so we will see you next week. Take care and God bless.